It's 6 p.m. on a Thursday here in Korea. Welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let's begin with the headlines. While the defense and foreign ministers of Seoul and Washington discuss stronger measures against North Korea, the Hermit Kingdom lets its presence be known with another failed Musudan missile launch. Meeting with her chief aides, President Makane called for a heightened defense alliance against North Korea and ordered a full investigation into a corruption case surrounding two government-linked foundations. In the third and final U.S. presidential debate, Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton wins praise for the way she alternately engaged and ignored her Republican rival Donald Trump and is hailed as the clear winner once again. The U.S. has once again pledged to provide extended deterrence for South Korea to counter the rising threats posed by Pyongyang. The pledge came during talks between the Allies' foreign and defense chiefs. Kim Hyun-bin starts us off with the updates from Washington, D.C. The focus of the so-called 2 plus 2 talks between South Korea's Foreign Minister Yim byung se and Defense Minister Han min gu and their American counterparts John Kerry and Ashton Carter was on strengthening the U.S. extended deterrence policy against North Korea's ever-growing nuclear and missile threats, as well as maximizing the effectiveness of the sanctions on the regime. Speaking at a press conference after the talks, Yoon said North Korea needs to give up its nuclear ambitions or suffer the consequences. Seoul and Washington have agreed that if North Korea does not give up its nuclear prowess, we'll make them pay dearly. We'll use all methods to pressure the regime, including sanctions. Kerry said that Washington will do everything to defend South Korea and emphasize the need to speed up the planned deployment of a U.S. missile defense system to the peninsula. There should be no doubt that the United States will do whatever is necessary to defend ourselves and to honor the security commitments that we have made to allies, including the Republic of Korea. And we will deploy as soon as possible a terminal high-altitude area defense battery to our Korean ally. Carter emphasized that the U.S. is committed to providing extended deterrence, guaranteed by the full spectrum of U.S. defense capabilities. He warned Pyongyang that the use of any nuclear weapons will come at a massive price. Make no mistake, any attack on America or our allies will not only be defeated, but also any use of nuclear weapons will be met with an overwhelming and effective response. The two allies also agreed to enhance extended deterrence by swiftly establishing a new high-level bilateral body called Extended Deterrence Strategy and Consultation Group. On Thursday, Seoul's Defense Minister Han min gu will hold talks with his American counterpart Ashton Carter at the 48th Annual Security Consultative Meeting. Mr. Han and Secretary Carter are expected to focus on the details of extended deterrence and issues regarding permanently deploying a U.S. strategic asset to the peninsula, as well as the specific time to deploy that to the south by the end of next year. Kim Hyun bin RDI News, Washington, D.C. Shortly after that meeting on measures against North Korea, Pyongyang launched another provocation. Connie Kim fills us in on what's believed to be the regime's attempt to make up for the failed missile launch last week and to pressure the U.S. Just five days after North Korea's failed missile launch last weekend, the regime has fired off another one, only to see it to end in failure. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said Thursday, the North launched what is presumed to be an intermediate-range Busudan ballistic missile at around 7 a.m. local time near the northwestern city of Kusong, the same area from which it launched the last one. The military believes the launch was an attempt by the North to make up for its failure on Saturday. Seoul's foreign ministry has condemned Pyongyang's latest provocation. Regardless of the success or failure of the missile launch, Pyongyang has clearly violated the UN Security Council's resolution. South Korea strongly condemns the launch as it's a serious threat to peace and security on the Korean Peninsula and in the international community. Pyongyang has so far tested the Busudan ballistic missile eight times, with only the launch in June succeeding. But if the regime gets the missile operational, its range of some 3,500 kilometers would put the U.S. base on the Pacific island of Guam within striking distance. 
Thursday's launch came just hours after South Korea's foreign and defense ministers met with their U.S. counterparts in Washington to discuss ways to deal with North Korea's threats. While some experts say Thursday's launch was a warning to Seoul and Washington, there are also voices saying North Korea has a longer-term goal in mind. Well, I think currently North Korea wants to successfully test its uh, nuclear weapons and long-range missiles so that they can use it as a game-changer to deal with the uh, U.S. new government. So I think before the new government comes in the United States, I think uh, North Korea wants to test it and succeed it on it. Hinting more provocations are on its way, North Korea's space agency said it'll continue to launch satellites into space. South Korea and the U.S. view such launches as covert tests of ballistic missile technology, while Pyongyang says its activities are purely for peaceful purposes. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Meanwhile, President Park Geun-hye called on her secretaries to beef up the defense alliance against North Korean threats. She also gave an official explanation for the latest allegations involving the top office. Song Ji-san shares with us the president's remarks. President Park says North Korea is standing against humanity, history, and the civilization of mankind and cannot survive. She made her remarks at a regular meeting with her top aides Thursday held in the shadow of North Korea's latest missile launch attempt. With security talks between South Korea and the United States underway in Washington, President Park said the allies must send a strong warning to Pyongyang as a new U.S. administration is set to take office in January. President Park also addressed the recent controversy surrounding her longtime confidant Choi Soon Sil, who is facing corruption allegations related to two foundations. The two organizations raised a large amount of funds from conglomerates in a short period of time and took part in many cultural and sports events related to President Park's overseas trips. The president said participation and the funding from the corporate sector added momentum to our key policy initiatives on the creative economy and cultural prosperity. President Park called for an end to the distrust and disputes and ordered a full and transparent investigation into the matter. She again stressed the need for national unity to counter outstanding crises as economic conditions are expected to get worse as uncertainties mount. Song ji Arirang News. Turning to the latest in the race for the White House, with less than three weeks until Americans go to the polls, presidential candidates Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump faced each other for one more round of televised debate. Our Hwang Ojun gives us the highlights from that event. It's an exchange that will be remembered as one of the most controversial, but it's not likely to be forgotten. More than halfway into the third and final presidential debate, Donald Trump responded to a question from moderator Chris Wallace about whether he will accept the final results of the election. What I'm saying is that I will tell you at the time. I'll keep you in suspense. His comments went viral instantly, and the big question now is whether Trump will actually break the long-running American tradition of a peaceful transition of power on Election Day. The response from his Democratic opponent, Hillary Clinton, was immediate. She called it horrifying. Later, she said, He is denigrating, he's talking down our democracy, and I, for one, am appalled. After the debate, Vice Presidential Candidate Mike Pence tried to temper his running mate's remarks by asserting there is no question Trump will accept the outcome, because he's going to win the election. The debate also dealt with some of the darker allegations in the campaign, including the sexual assault accusations against Donald Trump and the allegations surrounding Hillary Clinton's emails. Trump, who had said at the last debate that he would put Clinton in jail for deleting her emails, said she shouldn't even have been allowed to run in the first place. 
He also denied all allegations of sexual harassment and said the accusations from the women were all fabricated by the Clinton campaign. Clinton criticized Trump for his pattern of divisiveness, for not apologizing and for not owning up to his previous comments. Donald thinks belittling women makes him bigger. He goes after their dignity, their self-worth, and I don't think there is a woman anywhere who doesn't know what that feels like. Trump responded, Nobody has more respect for women than I do. Nobody. The candidates still have time to change the calculus in the race, but with only three weeks to go until Election Day, they don't have much time left. Hwang Wojun, Arirang News. Coming back to South Korea, lawmakers at the National Assembly should begin reviewing the budget bill for 2017 next week. But with rival parties at odds after clashes during the parliamentary audit over a number of issues, Korea's finance minister fear things may not get done in time. Shin Zemin sheds light on the finance chief's concern. Korea's finance minister, Yoo Il-ho, highlighted the importance of approving the nation's budget bill in a timely manner. I ask that the National Assembly pass the 2017 budget bill on time so the budget, which is aimed at boosting the economy and creating jobs, may be executed from the beginning of the year without any disruptions. While figuratively describing the government's financial affairs as a heart that's been beating to help revitalize the economy, you express the importance of managing government finances, calling on the parliament to review the bill by the legal deadline of December 2nd. He added that despite looming uncertainties at home and abroad like the ongoing corporate restructuring drive, unionized strikes and the unknown effects of an anti-corruption law on consumption, the country should work to bolster the economy through additional spending in the fourth quarter. The finance minister also explained the government's plan to submit a bill on fiscal soundness by the end of the month. The bill is aimed at preventing the buildup of exorbitant budgets by requiring the central and local governments, as well as public institutions, to devise plans for more efficient spending and put them in motion. It'll also include receiving final assessment on the execution of those plans. Although the country's fiscal health is in relatively good condition when compared with other OECD member nations, you said Korea should further solidify its fiscal soundness so that it can maintain flexibility in the face of changing financial demands in the future. As of last year, Korea's government debt-to-GDP ratio stood at 37.9 percent, significantly lower than the OECD average of around 115 percent. On the prospects for a country's economic growth, Korea's finance minister showed confidence, saying that despite all these mayhem of the recent Samsung Galaxy Note 7 crisis and the protracted automaker strike, Korea's fourth quarter growth won't be driven into negative territory. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The number of foreign em foreigners rather employed in Korea ticked up a bit this year thanks to the rise in the foreign population, though on a broader scale their employment rate has fallen drastically from previous years. E. G. Won takes a look at the digits. There are more foreign nationals working in Korea this year, but their employment rate has fallen drastically. According to Statistics Korea, 960,000 of foreigners were employed in Korea as of May. Among the 1.4 million foreigners ages 15 and over and are eligible to work. That's an increase of 2.6 percent or about 25,000. Still, the rate of growth is much slower than in the past two years, when it was increasing by double digits, recording just over 10 percent in 2015 and slightly over 12 percent in 2014. The agency attributes the sharp decline this year to a sluggish economy, slowing exports, and the government's ongoing corporate restructuring drive. For example, although more than 45 percent of foreign workers are employed in manufacturing, the industry only hired 1,000 people this year, as opposed to the 18,000 jobs added in 2015. This was followed by the retail and wholesale industries and the restaurant and accommodation business, which add up to about 19.7 percent, and private businesses and public services, which make up 19.4 percent. Nearly 15 percent of foreign workers receive a monthly income of between 1 and 2 million Korean won, or between 890 and 1,700 U.S. dollars. 
Ethnic Koreans from China represented the largest proportion of foreign workers in the country, or 46 percent, followed by workers from Vietnam at 7.4 percent. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. Korea's railway union is setting a new record as they enter day 24 of nationwide strikes. Thankfully, there are no major disruptions in railway services so far. But according to our Kim Min-ji, the prolonged demonstration is expected to bring about massive financial losses. It's the longest on record. The nation's unionized railway workers entered the 24th day of strike on Thursday. This breaks a previous record of 23 days, but Korea's national railroad operator Korail says trains are running more frequently than during the past walkout, despite a higher participation rate this time. It says operations are at nearly 83 percent of usual levels, almost six percentage points higher than in 2013. In contrast, freight trains are running at just 40 percent of normal levels, causing a disruption in the nation's logistics network. The strike began back on September 27th in protest against the adoption of a performance-based wage system. Coreal estimates losses from the strike will reach around 30 million U.S. dollars due to the dip in train operations, as well as the additional labor costs from hiring substitute workers. The operator has been making up for the labor shortfall by hiring short-term contract workers since last month and has vowed to take on as many as 3,000 if necessary. And amid rising safety concerns as relatively inexperienced contract workers are left to fill in, Coreal says it will employ 500 regular employees, the first time the company has taken such a move during a strike. It has also been stepping up field training for substitute workers to ensure safety and pairing them up with regular Coreal workers during rush hour. The operator has urged unionized workers to end the strike and return to work, saying it can't be considered legitimate if it's putting people's safety at risk. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. We've come to the end of our newscast for this hour, but we have more domestic news updates for our viewers in Korea coming right up. Thank you for watching. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Devin Whiting with more of your domestic news. As Parliament's annual audit nears its end, lawmakers today were scheduled to vet two government bodies, but instead ended up wrangling over a corruption scandal affecting the presidential office. Our, pres our political correspondent, Pak ji has more. Thursday's House Steering Committee audit was slated to focus on the National Human Rights Commission of Korea and the National Assembly Secretariat. But lawmakers' attention was focused instead on whether the presidential office's senior presidential secretary for civil affairs, Wu byung -woo, will attend Friday's audit of the top office. Wu has been called to attend the session, but he has notified the committee that he cannot. Lawmakers from the newly renamed main opposition party said Wu should present at the session to clarify the corruption allegations against him and the presidential office. We cannot comprehend the reasons why he cannot attend the session. He basically said that without him, the presidential office cannot work. Has the presidential office ever been paralyzed when a senior civil affairs secretary has attended a parliamentary session? The main opposition party had announced Wednesday that it had changed its name from the Minju Party of Korea to the Democratic Party of Korea after merging with the minor Democratic Party, an offshoot of the older incarnation of the Liberal Party. The People's Party also criticized the senior secretary. I once served as the chief of staff to the president. I know a senior civil affairs secretary does not replace the work of the chief of staff. And if a senior secretary ever undergoes a prosecutional investigation, he or she should resign. Ruling Senate Party lawmakers defended Wu, saying it's a parliamentary tradition not to force the attendance of a sitting presidential secretaries. The Conservative Party also continued to focus on the controversy stemming from a former foreign minister's memoir, which claims that Moon Jae-in played an essential role in a 2007 decision by the South Korean government to abstain from voting on a UN resolution against North Korea's human rights violations. Moon Jae-in is a person who aspires to be the president. The truth should be revealed. 
Meanwhile, Moon, the former chairman of the main opposition party, filed a libel complaint with the Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office against ruling Senate Party Chair Lee Jung-hyun and two other party members for falsely accusing him of conspiring with the enemy. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Staying with politics, the former chairman of the Democratic Party, Son Hak-gyu, announced today that he plans to return to politics. At a press conference this afternoon at the National Assembly, Son said he'll run for office again, but not as a member of any party. About two years ago, he'd announced his retirement after losing in the 2014 by-election. At today's press conference, Son told reporters he's giving up his former privileges as the leader of a party and wants to work to restart the Korean economy for the future of the country. Regarding his new political role, Son said he's not dead set on becoming president, though he has twice run for his former party's nomination. Sales at Korea's duty-free stores this year may top the 10 trillion won mark. That's about $8.8 .8 billion for the first time. The Korea Customs Service says sales at 50 duty-free stores nationwide have already reached $7.9 billion as of September, roughly 37 percent higher than the first nine months of last year. This is largely due to prolific shopping by tourists from China, who've accounted for almost half of all foreign visitors to Korea this year, as of August. Though less than half of duty-free customers are foreigners, they spend on average $350 per person, more than triple the amount of local consumers. Those are some of the stories we're following right now. Thanks for watching. We'll be back at 8 p.m. Korea time. Bye for now.